heard Storm I Ride from Between Two Worlds from the record by I, the interestingly named band from the uh, Occulto the, Brothers. Yeah, the, the Doom Occulto Brothers, and this is a recommended podcast. It's Mark. And I'm Jason. And uh, yeah, we struggled with uh, what to call this episode, but I, I think for indie rock fans to call it the Occulto Brothers kind of has like... Yeah. Uh, well, it's a, it's Demon As Doom Occulta and uh, Abath Doom Occulta yeah. from Mortal Fame. And uh, basically, we're going to be talking about their side project slash, I don't know, it's almost like their own genre, really. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's like Bathory, Motorhead. Yeah, between uh, the Demon As, uh, you know, eponymous band, uh, which actually, if you go back, I remember listening to some of his stuff on MySpace years ago. We put out, like, demos in, like, 07 or something like that. He did some stuff before that. Like after he left Immortal, it was more kind of some 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 gothy almost oh, really? uh, industrial kind of electronic <laughs> nice. bullshit. But uh, yeah, but now these these two records, I think the Between Two Worlds and March of the Norse that came out, March of the Norse came out two thousand eleven, and Between Two Worlds is two thousand six. After Immortal broke up, and everybody really was, I think really jo- at least I was really jonesing to have some kind of you yeah. know a bath ish isms in my in my music. But the, these two records are. Almost companion pieces, I think, yeah. to some degree, to Immortal. And I was saying that, like, they, uh, in a weird way, you know, between two worlds from I, which, you know, Storm I Ride, you just heard, like, really fit well after, uh, kind of Sons of Northern Darkness. You know, it just yeah. sort of was, like, kind of a nice companion piece to that, even though that record was 02, so it's, you know, four year. But as far as, like, the, they're kind of, like, riffing vocabulary, I think, was very much informed by that yeah. record. Because at that point, they they got away from the, you know, the machine gun drums and the super fast riffing. And they're almost coming up with their own real, yeah their own identity outside of just that hyper blast shit. Yeah, it was like a mid-paced sort of melodic riffing that was super catchy and And, and bringing, like, yeah, and... Some, some palm muting back into the stuff. And and really, the, the whole, and actually through all these projects, the... The one kind of like guiding force is Demon as his lyrics, mm-hmm. which have always been. You, you see him interview, and he seems like kind of a meathead, and like he doesn't really have much to say. But he's got a really good voice with his lyrics. Like there's always this, like you know, the whole the Blasher mythos, evocative imagery of nature, and a yeah, lot of like those he's kind of like he never seen like nothing ever comes across as being like like a bad mm-hmm. lyric. Like he doesn't have some kind of idea behind it. And these two guys have been, it seems like they've been connected at the hip forever, even though after, you know, Demon has left Immortal because of his um, his issues with tendonitis, he couldn't play because he played wrong 
yeah <laughs> for, <laughs> for so for long. all those years yeah. and if yeah and if uh, you're interested in how immortal or any of these guys play uh go to youtube and check out ben ash's video yeah a good friend um, of ours and friend of the podcast <clears throat> yeah where he basically goes through the first kind of era the demon as era of of immortal how you know how to play those riffs some of the fundamentals and and also how to not get tendonitis does he show does he show you how demon has played the wrong way does he sort of demonstrate this is kind he, of what he's he did? he's playing it the right like he's playing it the right way but he's showing how like the riffing patterns and yeah. like the the jazz sensibilities and a lot of those kind of things as well um but yeah but demon has was playing more with his wrist where he's just you know you can't play prolonged that way for that long without yeah. really having some serious damage any anything repetitive and, and that's always been like one of the weird aspects of like the immortal kind of sound that you maybe it's less pronounced maybe on these records than some of the immortal stuff is the i, I guess i don't know if i'd call it the improvisational way that they do it but like a bath has such a like left of center approach to like how he plays guitar how he even like approaches like black metal songwriting and um, it's just different it's, than any other band. And a lot of it, after probably after Blizzard Beast, that was kind of the last real hyperspeed record. I think that was that might have been the last record the Demon has on it, if I uh, remember I right. Think, yeah, because he wasn't at the Heart of Winter. Yeah. So like, it almost seems like Abath's songwriting sensibilities came out of, well, Demon has can't play that way anymore, so how can I still get in that kind of, you know, the dissonance, some of the fast stuff, but then it always changed, like it always alternated between that and some kind of, uh, some slower riffing or like some some yeah. chugging kind of riff, that at least to, to my ear that it always came out of okay this is why a bath is writing this way mm-hmm. and it's kind of seemed to go on and you know kind of like permutate from that yeah. ever since that era but well and a bath is doing the primary songwriting on the I record between two worlds and then Demonez mm-hmm. is doing the primary songwriting musically uh, uh, on March of the Norse but Demonez is writing lyrics for both records as well. Yep. And He's always it, been the kind of uh, uh, what, what, esthetician. That's not that's not even a word, I don't think. But he's always had the kind of uh, the lyrical aesthetic, and even the his lyrics have always kind of I think fed into the the visual aesthetic mm-hmm. of Immortal and kind of the the ethic of what Immortal really is. Because yeah. Immortal, they th- sometimes they fall into the black metal you know kind of banner, but uh, you're hard pressed except for diabolical full moon mysticism to actually go back and hear anything about Satan or unholy anything. Yeah. It's all their own mythos. It's all this, you know, almost like, like, you know, worshiping the, the glaciers in the North and the expansive fjords and all this kind of, it's like their own thing. Like it, it's almost as weird as like what Bathory was doing back in, you know, the eighties. Yeah. Like nobody really talked about Viking shit. Well, I was going like to say nationality like, uh, where it's not a hammer uh, racist thing, different too. things like that. You yeah. Know, Twilight yeah. of the gods and, uh, you know, um, why can't I think of the record before Hammerheart? Bloodfire death, you yeah. know, like from that point on, like there was, yeah, definitely like a, a evocative imagery and like certainly things like March of the Norse, which is, you know, talking so much about, there is an anthemic Viking kind of battle quality to it, but but I think there's also a battle quality to between two worlds, mm-hmm. you know. And there's some people have joked that the <laughs> the title between two worlds is almost like an allusion to like the fact that it's you know it's like halfway in between like Bathory and Immortal, like you know this yeah. like sound of like merging them together. Or someone said, uh, I, what did I read? Someone said it should be called Between Three Worlds, so you can throw Motorhead in there because it's like. A little little dose of Motorhead, which I think you hear mostly the Motorhead influence. I think on Storm I Ride, which is the song we just heard, that's probably to me the most Motorhead ish. Yeah, I, I don't. The thing that when I, I think hear people think of it too, the way he sings, it has a Lemmy esque quality to it. You know, I mean the Popeye well, kind of thing. Yeah, I think he's got that. actually both these guys at this point, but I think it was all informed by by Bath's vocals that they have very singular vocals, like. Mm-hmm. A bath's vocals are unmistakably a bath's, and same with Lemmy. Yeah. Nobody really sings like them. Except, well, you know, now the dude from uh, Inquisition has a little bit of, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, uh, unabashed, you know, kind of a bath isms to yep. his vocals, even though he says he's just conjuring demons or whatever. But, um, <laughs> but that's definitely demons, that's like definitely that. his own aesthetic, and that that's another thing. Like goes back to his. If you ever heard an interview with a bath, 
he has a mild speech impediment mm-hmm. as well. He has like a mild lisp, almost like his tongue's too big for his mouth. And when, uh, and I'm not trying to say this in any kind of disparaging way at all, but I think that leads to how his vocals are. Yeah. Because even like you go, some of my favorite videos to watch on YouTube are the Bath guitar lessons, which he did for what is it like uh, Guitar World or something? Yeah, I remember those. Pre-energy. There's like six of them or something, and uh, he does not. He, he's not. He's not a great teacher, which he says many, many times. <laughs> but when like most people, I've never seen this done before, where somebody's playing unmiked is playing guitar and they're a vocalist, you know, and guitar player for the band, death metal band as well. And he just like instantly I, uh, like goes right into it, like singing, no problem, unmiked. Yeah. And it's just fucking amazing to me. It's like, that's his natural vocal pattern. And he, you know, you know, kind of came into that and this is what I do. He's, that's and his voice. That's his voice. Yeah. 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 It's his creative voice, but I don't know where I, I was just a tangent, but yeah. Well, with, uh, Cause we were talking about the vocal style yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and stuff, but, um, you know, I think when this I record came out, uh, I, I for some people, I don't know if they were expecting Immortal Part Two or something. Um, I was kind of like pleasantly surprised that it wasn't just another Immortal record; that it had these it has its own identity for sure. Triumphant, you know, melodicisms to it. I mean, Icedale, uh, who we'll, we definitely need to sort of start talking about. Or here. Isdale, I think, is his real name yeah. or something, something close to that. You know what he brings? You know, coming out of the enslaved camp is, you know, and you're going to hear it in the next song that we hear, Battalions, where I, I think that song in particular is like this really nice blending of those sort of strange black metal-ish worlds of Enslaved and Immortal, yeah. who neither are traditionally black metal. Both They're completely outside. I have think. roots become their own Viking-esque thing. culture, you know, the Norse mythology of, of it, more so than the satanic qualities of black. Oh, yeah, yeah I mean, there's, like, some, there's something distinctly, like, Norwegian about both these bands yeah. that I don't think they could have gotten that sound from, like, if you grew up in Arkansas, that's not the sound you would lean toward or something. Yeah. Like, like, there's just a, and I don't know if it's just listening to this stuff for so many years that the Viking-isms, I, it makes me think of, of Bathory or sure. Amon Amarth or whoever, or Unleashed or whatever well, it might be. to me, it sounds like a very un- Amon Amarth-esque, the song, you know, yeah. just because of anthemic, you know, like, go to battle yeah. kind of thing, you know, and Bathory captured that really well, like on Bloodfire Death and Hammerheart. Oh, for sure. Hammerheart and and this like is that. actually an album, at this point, uh, a friend of mine's friend from San Francisco who's really into, you know, grew up on punk rock, but then started getting more and more into metal stuff. Hmm. Found, bought this record on a whim and basically worshipped it. Like, this is, he's like, this is the best record I've ever heard before. Not really knowing that, oh, this is the dude from Immortal. Yeah. Like, it, it, there's just something about this. It's really honest. Yeah. There, it's a little, it's, I don't think it takes itself overly serious. I mean, especially look at the, 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 <laughs> the photos the inside imagery, there. Yeah. You know, a, a bass, you know, doing his, he's just kind of, you know, hamming it up Gene Simmons mm-hmm. thing as well, but. Yeah, there's just there's just something I think is there's it came out at the right time for me. I was missing Immortal, really bad at this point. Yeah, and this thing came out and I just I fucking grabbed it on. Well, and I think it's a great metal record. It's not anything else besides that. It has moments you could argue that have black metal esque kind of things. It has moments that could be more power metal esque, as some speed metal moments, as some doom doomier, gloomier kind sure. of moments on it. But ultimately, it it stands like on its own in a way that like, you know, a Dio record would stand on its own from like eighty three, eighty four. Like it's just metal. It just, yeah. It just yeah. encapsulates metal. Whatever that means to you might be your definition of metal might be different than mine. It's got a little metal all, in it too. But yeah, there's some of that too. You know, that's the power metal aspect I would yeah. kind of throw in there. You know, uh, I mean, to me, it has a lot of German speed metal stuff. There's like moments of like Blind Guardian that you hear on like Curse We Are. You know, mm-hmm. like just the the speediness of it and the propulsion of it. You know, Iron Maiden is is definitely part of it. A Bathory is part of it for sure. Motorhead's oh, yeah. part of it. There's even like uh, the uh, song we wanted to play, but we really didn't have time. Days of the North Winds has kind of like a a Paradise Lost, Catatonia esque like harmonic moment to it that's like mm-hmm. doomy, a little dissonance, dissonant sort of well. thing going on. You know, uh, there's bluesiness to it, like Sabbathisms. You know, especially some of the solos and like Far Beyond the Quiet. You know, have like this soulful quality to them. You know, yeah. Um, and that's something you don't hear traditionally in like Immortal or in black metal. You know, is the 
bluesy, soulful qualities. I mean, because of the way that Bath just kind of had the immortal way of playing guitar mm-hmm. and bringing in a guy like Ice Dale, who's playing maybe more traditionally. I guess. I mean, Ice Dale reminds me like, like a, he would be. He almost reminds me of somebody that would have been in like the Norwegian version of Guns N' Roses. Yeah, yeah like he's, he's got like, like a he's slash a, quality to him. Or he, something. he cannot wear a shirt. It, the shirt <laughs> does not fit him. He just it, he works better without a shirt in general. Yeah, but he's just a great. Great fucking guitar player. Yep. And we should mention who the who the band is. I mean, sure. we've, we've mentioned that uh, uh, Abath is on vocals. Yep. And then we've got uh, T.C. King, also known as King of Hell, okay. uh, who is another Audrey Horn slash Gorgoroth. Audrey Horn is a band I think we should do a show on, even though I've we've never, never really heard them. Heard yeah. them but there's so many people that have been in Audrey Horn that are in, uh, especially in Enslaved. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think maybe even like the haunted a couple. It's, they've been like I, I always see that name on you know metal archives. They're sort of connected Ex- to people. Audrey yeah. Horn or whatever. But yeah, and uh, on bass, uh, who's probably best known from Gorgoroth, Armageddon, the original Immortal drummer on uh, on drums, then Ice Dale and uh, Abath. Abath. And Abath doesn't play any guitar in this record. It's just his rhythm guitar. Oh, okay, he's rhythm. Yeah, okay. Ice Dale's lead. Yeah, and that's again that and Abath wrote a, all the music. Such a different quality to it, you know. Yeah. And I'm sure he gave Ice still a little bit of wiggle room to like improvise some of the solos, you know, because oh, sure. a lot of them sound pretty soulful, like they're not controlled, you know, yeah, which is good. And so, but you know, a song like "Storm I Ride" kind of gets things sort of moving. I mean, what would you say is to you the defining quality of like the I song, you know? I mean, really, like the propulsive drums. It's almost like Mickey D of Motorhead. Yeah, kind of like speed that doop doop like constant double bass. Well, the way that that Mickey D on. played like on. You know, the King Diamond. Uh, oh, and Abigail. Yeah, where it's just propulsion, just sort of like moves. And yeah. that's that's a record where... And he's not a, he's not a flashy drummer. He's no. a solid, speedy drummer. And just seeing him play with Motorhead last year, he did about a... I don't know, it was like a five or six minute drum solo that wasn't the masturbatory drum solos that you typically see where he had a, you know, like a five gallon bucket of drumsticks next to him and he was flying. It was like a circus act, fucking flying drumsticks up in the air and just like cascading around That's behind him. But and this guy's pushing, I don't know, he's in his mid fifties yeah, and playing like an hour and 20 minute show of just this constant fucking fast ass double bass. But yep. that's as far as the, the speed of it and the kind of, uh, propulsive motion of it totally goes back to ace of spades motorhead yeah but then you've got i don't even know where that guitar sound is it's just a a bass got such a weird way of writing music yeah and it's not overly complicated but it's just weird choices that he that he makes like the that first the riff when he first start off is i don't even really that's it's like a little bit of bathory a little bit of venom maybe some Maybe a little bit of Celtic Frost, not even really. It's more yeah. new wave of British heavy metal. I was gonna say it's it's cleaner, you know. And then his vocals come in, and you're like, okay, this is something a little bit different. But and they also do what you mentioned last episode, the call out, yeah, uh, where he calls out Ice Dale right before he does his solo, yeah. which is I always love. <laughs> that, and this is a record. I mean, I can't. You, you mentioned one of your friends who wasn't really into metal so much, kind of globbing onto this. This is a record that you threw out to a lot of different people of walks of life and they could kind of glob onto it. Yeah. I guess it, it just depends if you can kind of look past the vocals on some level. Like, and again, people like you and I don't look past them, but get used to them, I guess for, for the non metal listeners. If, and yeah. once you can, like it's just, that's really the only thing record. The really the only know? thing to get past if you're not used to extreme metal is, and even if you are used to extreme metal, I know people that don't like, Inquisition, they don't like Immortal purely because of the vocals. Yeah. Which I see it as more of like, this is a really unique feature that I yep. really like about the band, but yeah. there's a lot of people who just can't get past non traditionalisms of, uh, of bands. But most of them probably don't listen to our podcast, I would say. Most people probably, listen to this probably are not. probably pretty open minded, I hope. So if you don't if you don't like the vocals on Storm I Ride, you might as well shut this episode <laughs> yeah, off say, because you might be it disappointed only keeps in going a lot that way. Things. <laughs> so. <laughs> Now, Demon has his own vocal approach that we'll, we'll get into later it's, in the it's show. It's similar, though. Yeah, it's similar, but it's it's more, I guess, traditionally black It's, it's more Corthon-ish, for yeah, sure. there you go. But So we've got uh, we've got a nice, healthy set, and each of these songs uh, coming up from I, uh, Between Two Worlds, kind of has its own unique personality. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll kind of give my thoughts on some of these songs and feel free, you know, to sort of jump in. But, you know, I already mentioned Battalions. Battalions! <laughs> very uh, anthemic, kind of Amanamarth-esque. Uh, Amana you know, it's very mid pace which is good. Uh, I guess there is a lot of Amanamarth-isms as far as the, the pace Amana and Marth tone. But takes all of their cues from Bathory, and so I guess it, for me... Well, and I Unleashed. Just, 
Yeah, and don't Unleash forget that. Fight. Unleash gets the they get fucking uh, butt fucked by these guys constantly. Yeah. Nobody ever says, "Hey, whatever." What about Unleash? Like, okay, it goes right from Bathory to Amon Amarth. Unleash were the original Viking Death Viking, Metal. Viking Death Metal band. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They have a song called "Fucking Viking Death Metal" yeah. for God's sake, which is fantastic. <laughs> and we're we're big fans of Unleash here. You know, even have we ever done an Unleash show? No, we've talked about it. We certainly should because yeah. the last record is great. Yeah, the last like five as, records. Yeah, Grizzle. Dick uh, Drizzle uh, trembles. Trembles. Yeah, yeah the, the tree there yeah. from uh, yeah. whatever. I was going to say Middle Earth, but that's... Well, you know, <laughs> and, and Slave gets thrown in there, too, you know, as part of the yeah. Viking Metal equation and stuff like that. They're more like the professors of yeah, Viking Metal. that's though. true. Yeah. They've sort of grown so so beyond it now. Amon Marth had the uh, Man of War covers, basically. Yeah, that, that kind of worked. Guys with mustaches and hammers, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt your but, train of Well, no, but I think I, uh, one thing to sort of mention in, in, um, is uh, King of Hell, um, some of the drifting bass playing that he does, like on this song and Far Beyond the Quiet, they're, they're, it's it's nice. Like It's it's something we don't usually subtly, hear in black metal. Yeah. And like his stuff with Gorgroth, at least. Like, sure. you don't, and bass is there uh, to fill up space. He's in Sog, right? Yeah, he was yeah, in Sog. Yeah, and the stuff he does in Sog. Or he was in Sog. I don't know if he still is, but he was yeah, on the first record yeah, at least. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, so those are some kind of things that sort of jump out. And really, this song to me just recalls like uh, In My Kingdom Cold or One by One from Sons of Northern Darkness. It just kind of has that yeah. like repetitive but like really momentous feel to it, but it's still kind of mid pace. It's not super in your face. Yeah, because you know? the, the riffing, which I think goes back to. The last couple of mortals before this too was that weird. There's fast riffing, but it was in little spurts. Yes, you know, and then you've got like it's almost like a slow riff, but played with like a weird fast picking style occasionally, mm-hmm. like intermittently kind of thing. Yep, it, yeah, it, we, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about when you hear exactly. It's it's just to- totally there. And then we got mountains, which uh, this has got some of the best I think guitar atmospherics you know on the whole record. Um, you know, mountains of ice torment my sight. You know, I mean, just some really <laughs> great things. And and I think Ice Dale plays some of maybe his best sort of bluesy lead solos uh real refreshing and it's cool like to me this is a song where when i heard mountains when it gets gets to this point in the record for the first time this was what really separated the band i as a its own unique thing from immortal sure yeah. you know like i could argue that the, some of the songs in the opening part of this record the first four songs have a lot of immortal isms here and there mixed in you know yeah. but like to me when i heard mountains i was like wow this is this is its own, you, you know, its own entity, you know, yeah. especially in mountains when the, the solo breaks out and there's this sort of like great scream that kind of happens and then guitar melodies sort of meld in. It's to me, it's one of the highlights of the whole record uh, is, is in this song. Um, probably might be my favorite song on the record, actually. I don't know if you have a particular favorite from I or not, but. Well, the, the thing in which I, if anybody, you can take a drink, but this is what I usually say in a lot of these things. I like to listen to yeah, albums in their entirety. These are two albums, March of the Norse and Between Two Worlds, I think, are two albums that should be listened to in their entirety. They're pretty thematic, yeah. And it yeah. was difficult to kind of just pull out certain songs. Like, they definitely, it's almost like the, the classical kind of mode of, yeah. uh, you know, we, we've got this one theme, but then we have different movements throughout the whole record kind of deal. But Yeah, and I'm more of a, I can do that, obviously, but I also have the the singles mentality because well, you, of you got that that radio station the, the DJ thing, thing. Yeah. you still got CDs occasionally will pull out they'll have a little piece of paper with numbers to say the track numbers track three play. four and yeah. seven on it yeah and I'm a mix I'm a mixed <laughs> CD guy too so like I, I I'm just very much you know like I know song titles because of that because I had to know them you know because it's my constant backdrop throughout the day to just play one yeah the album I can play time. like the new Paradise Lost record I think I played twelve times the first day I got it yeah. And you know uh, your your music listening is a little bit more focused. Well, and it has to be deliberate. because I, I have like such sparse time. You know, it's yeah, like, I get like four songs in the car uh, if I'm driving to work or yeah. driving home or like it's, yeah, it's my constant couple companion. songs in the morning for the kids start to pour in. You know, although sometimes I'll sneak. I snuck some uh, Catatonia sounds of decay in the other day. I just kids were like in my room and I just didn't care. I was mm-hmm. like. Yeah, you're just gonna have to deal with this deal for a few kids. minutes. It's I was fucking America. I was in the I was, <laughs> I was in the mood, you know. So then we go from mountains to uh, far beyond the quiet, which is the the epic, uh, the longest song on the record, uh, over seven minutes. And this is kind of a tribute to Corthon himself, uh, from what I've read. You know, it's kind of like in honor of him having just passed away. Yeah. Um, you know. You know, really, I think these two records are better than a lot of the Viking 
metal that Corthon did. I'm not really a huge fan of that era. Sure. I like some of the music, but vocally, I, w- I was never really behind it. I Blood Fire it, Death's the last, like, I think, truly great Bathory record. In yeah, my I like Hammer Heart. I don't but, love it, but I, I yeah. like Hammer Heart. Uh, Twilight of the Gods and Blood on Ice. Like, I've heard Blood on Ice was okay. It's. A, I mean, I I enjoyed it when it came out because I got to interview Corthon. Yeah. That was a, the once and the only time I got to interview the guy. And he was incredibly, you know, really, really good dude. And I was kind of stoked that... Okay, there's been a battery record on a long time. This is kind of a comeback. Sure. This was older material that was coming back, you know, yeah. kind of reinterpreting or something. But I wonder if we went and, and like spent some time with those records again, you know, if if we'd feel differently kind of having now gone through. Those the records are, are ones that I actually like the uh Jubilee Volume 2 versions because they actually cherry like that's a, a set of albums that actually like singles off and not the full gotcha. records. Cuz there's some al- there's some songs in there that are great. But as albums in whole, it's not. I don't listen to them in, in their entirety. Okay, and I haven't really spent much time with uh, Twilight of the Gods. I know um, the guys in Catatonia are really big on that record, which I know, tell, I'll, I'll, tells I just me like I almost need to like listen to it. If, if you know Anders and Jonas are like way into, I've that. got Hammerheart, but I don't own Twilight of the Gods anymore. Yeah, me neither. I the Hammerheart's the last one I own. Own. So. Yeah, but I've got something on the second Jubileum, but eh, mm. I'll give it. A, I'll yeah. give it a whirl again. Yeah. And there's the dudes from Primordial and a couple other bands that are putting together that. Uh, there's a Bathory tribute band where they do everything just from that era, hmm. and probably vocally, if it's it's kind of better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. that's uh, I can I can gel with that. But uh, and then from Far Beyond the Quiet, um, you know, which is probably one of the more mellower tunes on the record because it's open, kind of like some of the Immortal epic songs where they yeah. they're more open and stuff. We get to probably the fastest and thrashiest song on the record, which is Curse We Are, which uh, ends the record. Unless you have the, the Digipack bonus tracks. Uh, I don't, I don't have a couple. The, there's like two bonus tracks and then another like a demo version yeah. or something. But uh, but we're we're sticking to the original here. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Curse We Are is, is great. It's a uh, cool flurry of solos and stuff like that in the middle. Very kind of like you said before, Man of War. I said Blind Guardian. You know, just sort of that like... <laughs> Yeah, made speed, motto, yeah, speed metal kind of thing, yeah. you know. Um, it's it's great, you know. And there's some cool palm, palm muting in the in the pre-chorus, which is awesome, and it's cool. It's a good good propulsive song to sort of end the record and end our little set here. Yeah. So, uh, any other thoughts on uh, between two worlds? Between two worlds, we are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. That's so. It's all I got. <laughs> so we got battalions, mountains, far beyond the quiet, and curse we are. Enjoy.
Curse We Are, Far Beyond the Quiet, Mountains Battalions from Between Two Worlds from the I record. And uh, we move from, we're, we're quick here, we move from one immortal side project of the Occulta Brothers to another. And uh, March the Norse, dude, from, from 2011. Yeah, this, that, may, uh, this was on the year end. Sure. Yeah, I, I threw it on the year end. There's, it didn't get a lot of, uh, a lot of love. Um, Whereas the I record did, I felt like that got a lot of positive press when it came out. I, well, I think I, people were maybe because they were missing immortal. They were like immortal hungry, yeah. and immortal's back bigger than ever right now. Yeah. Really, I mean, after uh, All Shall Fall, that fuck was that? Was that two thousand nine that came out? Uh, two thousand nine or two thousand ten? I think two thousand nine. Uh, but you know, the kind of comeback record after being gone for what, like seven, seven years or something? Uh, yeah, O two was. Sons of Northern Darkness. So. Yeah, so it was it was definitely a while, but uh, you know, and this record is you know it was mentioned earlier is a little more subtle in in approach and I think with a, a lot of the glut of things that are coming out, people are just like, well, fuck everybody and their grandma's got a goddamn record coming out. Yeah, but the funny thing is that this actually shares you know two thirds of the members of I with with uh, Demon as we've got Armageddon on drums, yep. you've got Ice Steel. On guitar, and bass, yep. And uh, then Demon As is doing vocals and wrote the majority of the music. But then uh, Ice Steel actually he's he's accredited as as being a, an arranger. Well, and he's also a co-producer he was along a producer with uh, I record too. Yeah, with, Ice was. What the fuck's the guy's name again? Verbrand Larson from uh, the keyboard player from Enslaved. Yeah, uh, has actually worked on both of those records in some capacity. It's an interesting little family we have here. It's very. T- I think. I think the well, the enslaved guys are like Bergen area, mm-hmm. um, and then I think the immortal guys are just outside of that, in some tiny fucking little crazy burg where they just hang around, walk around glaciers and with their notepads and write <laughs> lyrics. But, um, but yeah, March of the Norse is much more. It's almost they almost take three different riffs throughout the whole record and slightly morph them. Yeah, throughout the whole thing, it's almost like you know, and you're talking that. The, the approach that a bath and, and some of them have to songwriting was kind of like out of a jazz, kind of like a modal theme or something like that. You know, if you, you know, the first time you hear like say Miles Davis kind of blue, there's something consistent about the whole record where like I could play you a song and you would know it came from that record. Yeah. You might not know what song it is and it doesn't really matter, but you would just know it fits with that theme of that record. Yeah. And that's kind of like when you hear like, like even the between two worlds, but but even more so on March of the Norse, every song is almost like, uh, like, in not insignificant, but like doesn't really like stand out from one another that much. I mean, there's like little moments or there's parts of like solos that you like sure. that or like little acoustic passages that yeah. we'll kind of chat about. But as a whole, it's like thematic. You know, it's like. It's all pretty mid pace. It's got a lot of like new wave of British heavy metal melodicisms along with a heavy dose of Bathory. More almost like the, more pronounced Bathory consistently throughout. You know, it's like Yeah. Our, There's lots of Hammerheart and Twilight of the Gods in this yep. thing for sure. Yep. But almost to its and not like the like like they're necessarily aping it, which I don't know if there's ever been a band that's really just completely ripped that off. Yeah. Like everybody seems to translate it a little bit at least. Uh, but this almost it just this album reminds me of like it's it's another side of immortal mm-hmm. of that whole kind of mythos. They don't talk about you know the Blashirk mythos or anything, but just that like when I'm listening to this thing, every, basically that and I I is like running across the glaciers. <laughs> March of the Norse is as the you know title insinuates is it's it's a slower pace it's thing. Like contemplating. It's, yeah, it's like you're 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 walking across these vast wastelands of of. Of winter and you know there's just this bleakness. Although there's there is sort of a battle, it, it, it maybe not. It's not as immediately battle ready as maybe the eye record is. But then when you get into like a song like a Son of the Sword or, or things like that, uh, some of it's almost like like contemplative. Like okay, we just we fought the battle. Yeah. Now we're walking onto the next con- you know conquer the next village or whatever it might be. Sure, that kind of thing. Like because there is some triumphantness to this, which yeah. I don't want to say it's this thing's just all bleak and no, because whatever it's, it's not very, at all. It's very listenable. I don't know. It's like a, yeah, it's not a easy listening uh, yeah. black metal. <laughs> yeah, or whatever you. I, I don't even know what genre to throw this in. Well, I think you know, like you said, uh, the sameness probably 
is what led to, I think, a lot of people thinking maybe it was underwhelming. You know, maybe it well, wasn't if, as dynamic. If you're the kind of person about. that, when you get a new CD, if you like to skip around, you're going to hear a lot of the same riffs. Yeah. And I think a lot of blogs and magazines are guilty of not listening to records more than a couple times before they review them. Yeah. And there's something that I probably listened to this thing when I last two times ago, and I was driving down to Kentucky, I listened to this almost the whole way down. Oh, wow. And uh, just because I had my iPod set to where it repeated the record, I was just like, eh, I, I want to keep listening to this. You know, it, it wasn't a deal. So I listened to it, I don't know, like four or five times in a row or something. But there's, it was just, it almost felt like it's just like this journey record, a document of a journey yeah. down there of an experience. So there's, and it's a, there's a lot of records that are like this that are really subtle that don't really, they don't jump out. They don't have singles. They don't break new boundaries. But I just, there's a lot of riffs and the guitar playing, I think, on this record is fantastic. Mm-hmm. It's subtle, but it's fucking great. Uh, but there's a lot of records where there's just that one, that kind of un, definable thing that you identify with on a record that just like i want to keep listening to this over and over and over yeah. again yeah no i i think it has it it's definitely kind of has like an it factor to it and although i still don't own a real version of it yeah i just bought it on <laughs> amazon today for like five bucks i couldn't find it on fucking record outside of 40 bucks yeah. and i was like god damn it i've got the promo still but yeah uh sorry demon Mar- marcus <laughs> marks marks way down Me and my goddamn the, the, vinyl the, ethics the, uh, yeah so I just I just need the plastic case. I will gladly it. accept a free CD, but I do not <laughs> yeah. buy them anymore. <laughs> uh, I just got the Gohor on CD. I didn't pay for it, but I got it. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I don't know. There's like it's hard to like break these songs down. Maybe. In, in, in... I mean, over the mountains is uh, an interesting vocal, which we'll be hearing here soon. Is an interesting vocal exercise where it's the uh, it's the bath approach to vocals, but He's actually holding out notes in more of like a harmonious way, which you don't often hear well, in this the, kind of stuff. And the but. other thing, too, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I totally forgot. The other thing that you hear on this record that you haven't really heard before, not on, on, not on much immortal stuff that I can kind of really think of, but there's a there's a choral aspect to yeah, some Yeah, like of the even with a, some keyboard things the here Between and there. Two Worlds song. Uh, a bath's actually At between two worlds I am like he's actually holding notes out in that yeah. kind of weird register which never happened before but this I'm world record. is like there's like a chorus of voices oh, yeah. on some of these songs you yeah. know, which like you haven't heard anybody in the immortal camp do something like that mm-hmm. before you know yeah and and that adds more of a I guess the epic quality but yeah you're right you know holding out the notes and things like that um, I mean under the great fires links a lot of things too like i mean all these songs are kind of linked together but that's got that great like acoustic kind of like ending that then like just slowly like kind of brings everything down and then it kind of re-kicks in with like over the mountains yeah you know and it it works it sort of ebbs and flows with like it's like classical music or something and Mm -hmm. and bathory and a lot of black metal is influenced by it's very yeah very anglo you know yeah exactly (laughs) you know but yeah the interesting thing even though that um the uh, the Ben Ash video that we talked about earlier, he mentioned some of the the chord choices and stuff uh, that that Immortal uses are like jazz chord progressions. Yep. Uh, but it's funny that they, there's jazz the kind of jazz chord progression thing mixed with this very Anglo classical kind of white music. Yes, you know they, they kind of and I don't know if that's like the more improvisational aspect or uh, even more novice aspect of just because these guys don't they're not classically trained players they're 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 playing from their gut, and I think it shows, and that's why I think I'm drawn to a lot of this stuff. Yeah. But having those two things, but then yet being in Norway, which is a very white, very affluent country, um, I wonder if just those two things together kind of like pop. That's why Immortals always popped out to me as being a band that they they never really fit in the scene, mm-hmm. but they they've gotten a, a immense amount of respect, and now they're at this level where. Who who does not know who Immortal is? Yeah. Who doesn't send out some stupid thing on Facebook that of, uh, you know, demonized or a bath walking through a metal detector or riding a surfboard or like they're they're pop they're pop culture icons at this point. They're on Guitar Hero. Yeah. The bath is on Guitar Hero. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's, yeah, it's it's strange. You know, uh, didn't they use? No, I'm trying to think. They use his likeness like some. Well, there's like. A, People post like Facebook pictures of like cats that look like a bath. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's all I mean, there, there's all this kind of crap. It's all, it's all pretty. So funny. they've been. Yeah. It's because I still think of these guys as like, you know, the pure Holocaust record. Like nobody gave a shit about them. Yeah. I still kind of see them at that at that point. They still kind of hold that same reverence to me. But yeah, that's kind of the way I see. You know, like I I I'll still always think of Opeth as like Orchid Morning Rise. Yeah. You know, that nobody knew about him. I wish Michael had never grown that mustache. Yeah, damn fucking <laughs> shit stash, really. Took him in a, a weird egotistical place. <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah, so let's uh, let's hear what this is all about. The, these four songs, actually, that we're going to play all kind of connect to each other in terms of uh, the sequence if you buy the album. So you, mm-hmm. can, you can capture the Mark listening experience of listening to songs consecutively not in a single well we're actually gonna yeah the one that's not written on here is uh northern hymn which oh, will, which will be on there that no that oh see, oh, I, oh. I, I i decided to it change things the up four, a little bit. the four in a row that all connect to each other okay. and we'll, we'll end with the, i got gotcha. you disconnected song so we've got a son of the sword where gods once rode under the great fires and over the mountains enjoy
over the mountains, under the great fires where gods once rode, and a son of the sword. To grandmother's house we go. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, we've, uh, we're going to close things out with the aforementioned uh, stuff that Mark was talking about, which is Northern Hymn and All Black and Sky. And uh, Northern Hymn is the, the sort of intro, choral intro that opens up the Demon Ez record. Which is probably the most Bathory-ish yeah. part of I the mean, whole thing. Odin's of... Ride Over Nordland is what I wrote down. That's kind of what it's... You know, sort of minus the crackling fire, and you got yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, but you know, and then all black and sky. Very, to me, it's maybe the most triumphant song on the record. It's that and just the I don't, the riff. I'm fucking air guitaring to that, even though it's not like a it's not like a drop to your knees, you know, November rain kind of solo thing. Yeah. But it's just I don't know. It's so fucking catchy, and just something about it just really connects with me. Well, there's definitely the there's some Iron Maidenisms. Yeah, with the, within the new wave of British heavy metal that that's sort of pronounced throughout this record. So. Well, and hearing yeah that the the kind of immortal approach to songwriting with more major chords and more triumphant sounds instead of the kind of more bleakish yeah. things that we hear on you know like All Shall Fall or something. But yeah, it's a really pretty interesting song. Yeah, so you know, I mean, this was sort of a left to center thing that we wanted to do. There's you know, <laughs> there's no really way to to do an entire show just on one of these two records but they almost do kind of could have strange, padded it out but it's strangely it makes sense fit together yeah. you know in a way yeah. you know they're they're part of the canon of immortal but yet they're kind of unique and and they almost sort of fit together as like i part one and demon is almost as like i part two and it has some sensibilities you know but yeah it's still its own unique kind of thing it's, i think i i yeah march of the north almost seems like intermission between uh the last immortal record and the next immortal record yeah yeah and just like, like call before the storm kind of thing to sons of the northern darkness yeah this you know march in the north connects to all show all uh, show fall all show fall yeah so for some reason i always think all show pass i think i like gandalf like i don't know something. with the george harrison record yeah but that must be yeah <laughs> Yeah, I always think of the X X to fall, the because X to fall yeah, and all shall fall Converge. came that out came the same out in year, two thousand nine as well. Yeah, yeah, that's weird. <laughs> weird. Um, all things must pass with George thing, Harrison. All things must pass. Yeah. yeah, all things must fall will be his next. Yeah, posthumous record. Yeah, uh, sad. Um, I lost my train of thought on that one. It's too late <laughs> for sure. But yeah, let us know what you thought. Uh, you know, most people probably know the I record. Well, I mean, I, I assume that, but maybe not. Uh, you might be pleasantly surprised. It's difficult. If you don't know what the title of the record is, it's difficult putting an I in Google yeah. and trying to find anything. Yes. But yeah, <laughs> Between Two Worlds. Uh, and I've still never heard what, what the fuck that means. I, I, I assumed that it would be that, okay, if you're looking through the I section in metal, that it would be I and then Immortal. And like, oh, what's yeah, this? These are connected. And yeah. it's just a cover with a with metallic a I. I on it. <laughs> Letter I, not like a eyeball. Either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's weird. I'm sure it does stand for something at a certain point. We have to ask Demonus because he writes these lyrics. He's probably has some concept behind yeah some of what he's doing. But uh, yeah, and then of course I think the underrated and kind of under the radar March of the Norse from last year. You know, a lot of people I don't think uh, got a hold of that. I know I was a late comer to hearing. I knew it was out. Mm-hmm. But then like I think you initially or maybe Chris were kind of like, yeah, it's it's all right. But then, like, yeah, more that was one thing we kind of talked it. about a lot. It was like, at first, I was like, eh, it's all right. It's boring. But yeah. then we talked, me and Chris talked about it quite a bit. Uh, Chris Dick, who's been on the show quite a few times. And we're just like, this is, uh, it's subtle, but this guitar playing is just great. Yeah. Not everything needs to be flourished and mm-hmm. fucking spastic and crazy. You know? And I think that's a nice thing. The the linkage between these two is the, you know, what Ice Dale sort of brings to the table. You know, mm-hmm. it's kind of just classiness you know really yeah. you know and he's not having to like flash it up no shirts required no shirts required <laughs> yeah he's cl- classy with no shirt on uh the only way to be classy that's right hopefully no shoes if i well. if i had those pecs you know i wouldn't wear that's, a shirt either that's so. true that's true you gotta start lifting weights <sighs> so but uh yeah so let us know what you thought shoot us an email at requiem podcast at gmail.com or check us out on uh facebook mark and jason on itunes leave us a comment <laughs> If you'd like to become an executive producer, we could definitely... Uh, we can greatly appreciate it this time of season. This is the renewal of the domains. So if you'd like to be a son of Blash Eric, please uh, send us some money. Mighty, mighty Raven call. Uh, yeah, anyways. Uh, and if you would like to get in contact, or uh, if you do want to donate, requiempodcast.com. Yes. Uh, 
and as the website you can get some artwork up there you can get some t-shirts coffee mugs all kinds of good stuff or uh become an executive producer which is uh, that's true or here's a here's a treat for you if you like merciful fate oh yeah go to cvcomics.com and uh on the left or actually it'll be the main thing on the page look out look to see what i'm doing with a bunch of other great artists about merciful fate it is a tribute to one of the best bands in heavy metal yeah and obviously uh a guy that had an influence over this scene as well. Over, I, I think, yeah, arguably probably one of the most important. Especially even if you didn't like his, if you weren't influenced by his music, you were influenced by his theatrics. Sure, sure. Yeah, and you know when we talked about like the the drumming of Mickey D, kind of being like uh, yeah, Armageddon. You there know, you go. This sort of propulsive, sort of not flashy, but just propulsive. You know, yeah, definitely. Uh, Kim Bendix Peterson, one yeah. of the best guys ever. There you go. So. All right, well, for uh, Recommend Metal Podcast, Demonez and I, I'm Jason. And I'm Mark. <laughs>